Hello and welcome to the Just Interesting Podcast. Joining me, Robin, is my good friend, Martin. Hello, Robin. How are you? Hello, Martin. How are you? I'm all right, thank you. Good. I'm very happy to be here with you, but also a little bit sad because it's just the two of us today. I know. very special I know. episode. Alex has Alex been lying down on a motorway <laughs> protesting the climate crisis <laughs> yeah. and he's been arrested and he's currently locked up in a jail cell. <laughs> He was dragged off the M25 last <laughs> night, and yeah, we haven't seen him since. So the M25. <laughs> <laughs> He's on the ring road around London, and uh, unfortunately, despite that's the what's fact to the Alex. conference is happening in Glasgow, where yeah, he, mate, he, he doesn't <laughs> care. He, he actually, <laughs> that's true. Good point. Yeah, he came, <laughs> he came down to London to protest <laughs> when the conference got, is next door. <laughs> he got lost. Okay, he got lost. He thought got it was in lost, London. Yeah. It's all this smog from the climate change. That's the problem. Oh, exactly. Down, got lost. Exactly. Oh. So, so well, um, yes. basically, Alex, you know, we're we're <laughs> yeah, we're, 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 we're with you, man. We're backing you, and yeah, we hope well, to see you here fairly soon. Yeah, when your bail's paid, we'll we'll, we'll drop some cash for you later. But uh, exactly. yeah, sadly, Alex isn't here for this episode. So this is a slightly different episode to usual as a result of that, because since there's only two of us, it kind of feels a bit pointless doing a quiz. So we're going to skip the quiz. Sorry to all your quiz fans. Don't worry, it will be back, and it will be better than ever. I promise. Um, but what we'll do today is we'll be discussing a big topic, as Marty may have hinted at already, which is COP26, the Conference of the Parties, number 26, the sequel, uh, at the UN Climate Conference in Glasgow, happening now, actually, at the time of recording. Uh, it's got a few more days to go. And um, we thought we'd just um, put our uh, sceptical science hats on and, and look at what they've done so far, what all the policies they've announced, and say, is this good? Is this bad? What's going to happen with climate change? Um, but don't worry, we won't be ending on a sour note because A, we're optimistic people, and B, we will be looking at your comments of the week after we've discussed COP26. But before all that, we'll be discussing what we've learned this week. So, Martin, what have you learned? Oh, I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> so I, I learned this week uh, a little fact about rattlesnakes. And, you know, rattlesnakes, there's that... The very famous rattling sound when yeah, predators, yeah, yeah. you know, when predators come close, the, the rattlesnake defends itself by, you know, rattling uh, in order to, you know, to, 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 yeah, to, you know, well, what's, what's the sound of a rattlesnake? It's kind of like, I can't yeah, do it. Like, yeah, it's like a, yeah, yeah, it's very distinctive. Isn't yeah, it? You, yeah, you, yeah, we know. Well, maybe I'll have it, you know, next week as the as the buzzer or something if, <laughs> for the quiz, um, just to you know let people know what the sound of a rattlesnake it sounds like. Um, but anyway, yeah. So a rattlesnake, uh, generally, when people come close, it has this this kind of this this frequency, which apparently is around forty hertz. Okay, okay, forty hertz in frequency. So 40 hertz, yeah. I don't have any reference point here, but just just trust me on this one. It's around about forty hertz, which is a, a lower frequency when a threat yeah. is like fairly middle distance let's say but apparently when an intruder gets a little bit too close for comfort um they actually increase this hertz uh, to uh, to a signal between 60 and 100 hertz which is a much higher frequency yeah. and um and the reason they do this is to to basically make predators think that the rattlesnake is much closer to them than it actually is so studies have been done um where people have in basically in like a virtual reality where people have had to decide how far away they think a rattlesnake is based on the rattle. And yeah. when it's at this 40 yeah. hertz, people are pretty accurate at knowing how far far away it is. But when they get to like a marginally closer to the snake, it drastically increases um, to sick between 60 and 100 hertz. And they think it's much, much closer. And the reason they do this is so that, you know, predators up close get confused and think that it's, you know, really, really close to them and back off as a result. Or yeah. if they're a predator who's looking to, you know, take out a rattlesnake, then maybe they get a little bit spooked and are like, oh, I'm actually, yeah, I'm really close or give their game away, you know. So that's what I learned this week. Rattlesnakes are pretty clever at adjusting their rattle to, uh, to ward off predators. That's fascinating. And to be honest, it makes me even more scared of rattlesnakes. Because it means they're cleverer than I thought they were. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this seems fairly intuitive, doesn't it? Like, you know, yeah, rattling your rattling your tail a bit faster. Um, but yeah, I thought that was pretty pretty amazing that you know, people, especially the study. You know, people can actually tell how far away a rattlesnake is at one one distance, but then they trick you into thinking they're they much do. much closer. It's, it's scary. I mean, on the one hand, I suppose it's, it might make me feel safer if I'm ever unlucky enough to be in a desert where there are rattlesnakes. If I hear a rattlesnake, now that you've told me that, 
my brain might go, ah, it's actually further away than I think it is. Mm-hmm. I'm all right. I'm okay. And, and then, then, then it gets you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, um, the, the, the basis of this is just to avoid rattlesnakes. That's kind of point, does, point yeah. number one. Yeah. Um, especially, yeah. I mean, I don't know how many deaths there are a year from rattlesnakes, but um, do you remember the fact I, I brought to the table a few weeks ago, actually probably a few months ago now, about yeah. um, spiders and the fact that there's only been yes. like, there's been no deaths from spiders yeah. in Australia since like the mid to late 70s which yeah. is an insane fact, whereas there are thousands and thousands of snake deaths a year. So out of those two, when people say, oh, yeah, I'm not scared of snakes, but I'm scared of spiders, I mean, it's irrational. Actually. It's irrational. Be scared of rattlesnakes. Yeah. Possibly. <laughs> no, I would be, yeah. <laughs> Especially now. Well, my next question, and I assume we don't know the answer to this, is if they're taking <laughs> the not. frequency of the, the rattle, um, yeah. is that a is that a, an instinct they're born with? Or is it a mm. learned behaviour that they're taught? Ooh, you know? good question. I, I, like how, I, it's got to be inst- instinctive, hasn't it, surely? I mean, there are, there are mother yeah. snakes teaching them how to do this, I imagine. <laughs> yeah, like, um, now children, this is how you rattle. The instinct's an amazing thing, isn't it? Like, yeah. even with um, deers when they're first born, or giraffes, or most mammals other than humans who are, seem to take ages, but they stand up yeah. straight away. It's like an amazing reaction to predators. Like, I need to stand up so that if a predator comes, I can get away. It's instinctive. They're like, I cannot yes, defend myself. True. So yeah. they, so they get to their feet. Um, whereas humans don't do that by instinct. So, yeah, these defensive mechanisms to survive is so, so innate in so many creatures. It's just an, an amazing thing. And it's, it's another example of it. It is, a, it is a nice reminder, actually, that, like you just said, the... Um I think the cost of evolving the human brain to the point where we're intelligent, we can communicate and we can invent technology is that we've lost most of our instincts. And I'm definitely mm-hmm. the kind of person who, if I were lounging on the sofa and a serial killer burst into the room with a knife, I'd probably just kind of s- sit there on the sofa looking at him for a good minute, thinking, what, what do I do? What's, 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 the, what's the right thing to do here? Are you a, knife, are, are you a knife salesman? <laughs> yeah, trying to assess the situation. <laughs> you must be an Amazon driver who's trying to open a parcel with a knife. Are you wearing a balaclava because you're cold? Yes. All of these things could be possibilities. Oh, you're stabbing me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Got to be careful yeah. of those those knife knife well, men and rattlesnakes. That is uh, that's an amazing fact, actually, and that I don't think my fact can uh, can live up to that. But oh, I'm sure it enough, will. Speaking of murderers, that oh. is actually what my fact is about. Oh. And that was not a planned segue. That just, that just happened. Clearly my brain was thinking <laughs> about it. Um, so this week I learned that the first woman in America to be sentenced to be executed on the electric chair was Lizzie Halliday in 1894. Ooh. But... Okay. Nin- wait, 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 when? 1984? 1894. Sorry. I was going to... 1894. I was going to say that'd be recent, wouldn't it? Really recent, yeah. <laughs> Um, but she was she wasn't executed actually. Her se- her sentence was commuted. Oh, okay. To to imprisonment because yeah. of, she was insane. Ah. Uh, so she, she was the first woman to be sentenced, but not actually the first woman to be executed. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Electric Lizzie. Electric yeah. Lizzie. Yeah. Except yeah, although she wasn't. She wasn't. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm interested. Was... The I mean, the breakdown in America is heavily skewed towards men, isn't it? I, I'm interested. Yeah. This is something that. That I'm sure that people have done research on of, of the death penalty and how um, mm-hmm. it varies between gender. Yeah, it's something maybe we can discuss in another episode because I do not have the facts in front of me. That's actually yeah, maybe we should do that because be, be, I've be. got a couple of questions now that you bring to mind. Like first is what's the ratio of women to men who are sentenced to death, and then what's the ratio of <coughs> men and women who are actually whose sentences are carried through. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm I sure, wonder sure, if there's sure. more commuted yeah. sentences for women. That's or me, that's not, being, maybe, yeah. because I mean, that's fewer me being of very them are sentenced. You know, yeah. 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 yeah, perhaps, It'd perhaps. Be nice to know. Yes, so let's we'll, look we'll that up. episode about that. Yeah, yeah. be good. Yeah, be good. Let us know in the comments, if you're watching us on YouTube, um, or if you're listening to us on the podcast platform of your choice, contact us on Twitter at JInterestingYT, and let us know if you'd like us to discuss that stuff about female male sentenced to death in America. Probably America. <laughs> we might do the world. Who knows? We might, might broaden the scope of it, but America's got a lot of people being sentenced to death. We could do the UK, but we don't have the death penalty. It would be a moment. short episode. <laughs> it would <laughs> yeah. be a very short episode. We but, might get but, it back, who knows. But, you know, the, the Conservatives could, of course, illegally change the, uh, the, the rules, let's just say. <sighs> yeah, they could. Yes, they could. They could. Yes, if anyone's anyone seen the watched... news this week, British <sighs> politics. 
Our government is now the pandemic. The worst the pandemic is over. They're they're living up or living down to all the things that we expected of them uh, back in twenty nineteen when we elected them. Yay! Mm-hmm. Anyway, mm-hmm. that's that's a discussion for another time. Maybe, it is. Fact, maybe we'll do a Patreon about it. Ooh, who knows? Talking uh, of broken promises. <laughs> 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 Let's talk about COP26 and do our partway COP26 review. The panel of experts is assembled. Martin and I will apply our considerable scientific <laughs> knowledge and sharp brain power to the policy announcements. Well, that's not even... That's a bit generous, to be honest. Let's just say announcements that have been made at COP26. So before we get into the nitty-gritty, maybe I should do a bit of context for everyone listening. Because, oh. I mean, I know I've been asking this question. Why is it called COP26? It's called COP26 because it's the Conference of the Parties, which is the United Nations term for this event. It's called 26 because this is the 26th attempt at getting (laughs) people together to develop some kind of action plan and meaningful policies to uh, combat climate change. And I think also it's worth noting before we begin that Martin and I will be operating on the assumption that climate change is definitely happening and man-made climate change is the primary issue. In fact, uh, I think we're in agreement with uh, the UN's estimate that 94% of climate change, rather global warming that has occurred since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution about 200 years ago, um, just over 200 years ago, 94% of that has been caused or driven by man-made emissions, uh, mostly carbon emissions. Uh, the other 6% is naturally caused climate change because climate does change in the history of the globe uh, and the billions of years that the Earth has been around. The climate has changed quite a lot. It used to be a big molten mass of lava and now it's a mostly blue semi-paradise depending on whereabouts you are. Um, climate change is important, of course, um, because of the potential catastrophic events that will and are, in fact, uh, resulting from it. So we've all experienced extreme weather in the past couple of decades. It's getting worse. We're getting massive storms, hurricanes, tornadoes. Flooding is getting worse. Summers are getting hotter. Winters are getting hotter. Summers are getting colder. Winters are getting colder, depending on where you are. Um, And of course, the the fallout from this is not just natural disasters that flood people's homes and destroy their environments and force them to flee to other parts of the world where they can just live and obviously kill a lot of people as well. But um, the reduction in food sources, food supplies. The change in weather means that plants are unable to grow in parts of the world the way they used to, which means we can't farm crops, which means we can't grow food to feed the ever-growing human population, which I think is estimated to be about 9 billion in the year 2050. It's a lot of people, a lot of mouths to feed. And as well as because of those reasons, because of um, starvation, um, because of environmental destruction from natural disasters, um, at the moment... 22 million people have been classed as climate refugees, as people who've been forced to leave their homes and flee to another country because of climate change. 22 million have been classed as that. It's probably more because it was only about a decade ago that they started classifying them. But that number is estimated to be 1.2 billion climate refugees by 2050. So even if you don't care about the natural world, Hopefully you care about humans and what will happen to them as a result of climate change and quite probably what will happen to you because wherever you live in the world, this is going to affect you. Yeah. So this is why politicians in the United Nations in particular think it's a really important matter and why COP26, uh, which is happening right now in Glasgow in the UK, in Scotland, um, not far from where Alex, uh, well, quite far from where Alex is currently residing in jail. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's he's, in he's near, near Reading, I believe. He's in Reading, yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's why they're trying to get together to come up with an action plan. The most famous previous COP conference, COP conference, that's tautological, um, was COP21, I think, in 2015, which was the Paris Accord or the Paris Agreement, which the United States famously, under Donald Trump, uh, withdrew from. And that set an agreed target based on the scientific data to try to limit the rise in temperatures by the end of this century to 1.5 degrees as a global average temperature. And that's the maximum limit that scientists think we can afford to let the Earth warm up by to avert the worst effects of climate change. They actually currently think that at our current rate of fossil fuel consumption and carbon emissions and deforestation and urbanisation, 
and pollution. We will pr- global temperatures are probably on course to rise, I think, by 2.7 degrees by the end mm. of this century. And in order to stop the, you know, an ecological disaster that will basically see the end of the world as we know it, and the extinction of the human species, as well as many others, uh, we need to keep it below a rise of two degrees. And the safest um, minimum we can th- let temperatures rise by, if we curb our behaviours now, is 1.5 degrees. So the important thing to note is that it's happening, temperatures are rising, we can't stop them rising because it's too late now, it's all because of the Industrial Revolution, and but if we change our behaviours now, we can limit the rise to 1.5 degrees, and that was agreed at the Paris Agreement in 2015. Unfortunately, I'm sorry this is going on for a long time, Martin, thank you for <laughs> right, waiting. It's Unfortunately, a good, a good summarization. Um, um, the 2015 Paris Agreements where everyone got together and said, and I think literally everyone, uh, the entire world, I think, that turned up to the United Nations, um, agreed this, said, we're going to put together action plans to re- curb the rise in temperatures to 1.5 degrees by the end of this century. Unfortunately, um, no one has actually met their self-applied targets by 2020. They all said, by 2020, we're going to have done this. Nobody's done it. Literally no one. So... Um, that's why this COP conference, COP26, is particularly important because it's mm-hmm. pretty much the final attempt for the world's nations to actually do something. So thank you for listening to me. Um, sorry about <laughs> that. I hope that was coherent. Um, sorry, Martin, you're going to say something. I have no idea what I was going to say. But um, what I would say is that the, the precedent set by the Paris Agreement was a whole load of talking and not yeah. enough action. And I think going into this, that is always going to be the worry for us sceptics, and I, I include myself and in you in that, is that uh, <clears throat> there will be a lot of talk about you know cutting emissions to uh, to, to, to net zero um, yeah. by 2050, as a lot of countries have tried to, uh, to, to you know to express. But the likelihood of that happening, we're always going to be sceptical when, when politicians make these promises and then for years, for decades, for 25 other conferences <laughs> haven't reached these goals. And so, as we'll come on to, I imagine, there's been a lot of pledges that have been pledged by various oh. nations around the world, and there's been a lot of talk. But until we see this action actually happening, I think uh, Greta Thunberg was quite on the point about saying that, you know, it's they're basically lying to your face about you know what they're yeah. saying. I can't remember the exact terms she used. What was it? What did she say? But, um, but yeah, like, until we see results we are always going to be sceptical. Yeah, and I have to admit, there has been lots of talking. Like, I mean, it was, it was the plan all along, but the first... It's a 12-day conference, I think. Um, but the first four or five days so far have just been lots and lots and lots of speeches given by every world leader, which is inevitable because all the world leaders are there. They've got to feel like they're contributing somehow, so they're all getting an opportunity to speak, which is only appropriate in a democratic process. But at the same time, we really need some meaningful action. So we thought we would go through what's been announced so far, and we're around halfway through the the COP26 at the moment. Um, So maybe we'll review this again in a couple of weeks once we've had the second half of the conference. Um, But we thought we'd go through what they've announced so far. Like Martin said, several pledges have been announced, and we'd react to them and try to bring some kind of analysis that can be brought, because as we'll discover, spoiler alert, there's a lot of um, headlines but not much um, meat to the bones of these headlines <laughs> at the moment. So uh, it's hard to judge exactly what is going to happen. But um, let, let's, let's go through them, uh, the major ones that have been announced so far. I thought we'd get um, pass- possibly a, a fun one out of the way first, <laughs> which is um, that uh, Jeff Bezos <laughs> um, <laughs> unexpectedly turned up at COP26 and pledged to give uh, $2 billion to combat climate change um, as the first step, I think, in a fund he's established which he aims to give, through which he aims to give $10 billion towards combating climate change. Uh, so, yeah, Martin, what, what, what are your <laughs> thoughts on that? I mean, it's, we've been saying it for years, haven't we? Like, billionaires, if, if you're going to be in a situation, a society or a world that allows billionaires to flourish and to make make I mean, what's he, what, how much is he worth? Like close to $170 billion? Probably Some, more, actually, yeah. now. Yeah. But, um, you know, they, they have to be able to give back. They have to give back 
to the world, especially when there's you know, so many horrendous disasters going on and the you know the ongoing climate crisis, if you want to call it that. So yeah. two billion. It's, it's compared to his net worth it's not a huge amount but you know people say that jeff bezos is notoriously stingy uh, and so setting up this to you know ultimately give 10 billion dollars it's a huge amount of money and can go a long way yeah um nothing with bezos comes for free though you know it's, it's a publicity ultimately it's a publicity yeah a piece as well from you know from yeah. a skeptical point of view but i think this is you know, it's good i mean in terms of the details as we say with a lot of this there isn't much uh meat on the bones you know he said that it'll be used to fight climate change and restore land what does that mean <clears throat> cool cool i cool. mean who, who's 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 actually getting this money who's yeah. going to be uh, processing it is it going to go to na- nations and national governments or is it going to go to like a, you know a, 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 yeah, a fund a mutual fund yeah. or different charities there's a little bit about a little bit uh, up in the air about what actually this means um but but good Good. I mean, billionaires, they are the ones who, who are able to make huge differences very, very quickly um, with with giving their wealth and also, you know, giving their influence as well, as much as their wealth. Yeah. And so, yeah, this is a, this is a good a good move. I mean, he, wasn't he quoted saying, I was told that seeing the Earth from space changes the lens from which you view the world, but I was not prepared for just how much that would be true. And... Um, Shatner kind of echoed that as well. Obviously, not a billionaire, but um, yeah, <laughs> but had very, very strong thoughts about you know saving our world and saving us from a, a, a climate disaster um, after going into space. So maybe that money that was spent on that wasn't all uh, a complete waste of yeah. selfish endeavor. If this actually forces action, maybe that's a too positive a spin on it. But anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm. Uh, I'm I'm cautiously optimistic that he'll he'll up this pledge if he sees the um the good work that's going on, but yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's Amazon, you know they're they're, yeah. <laughs> they're they're quite a big player in in uh, destroying the the climate in the first place, aren't they? Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, aiding, this, is, yeah. aiding it, so. yeah. this is it. I was I was going to say there's um it brings to mind um there's a commentator uh he was a journalist oh he still is a journalist but he was like a journalist for newspapers and now he does he researches books and gives talks um in america called anan garadras and he spent the last couple of years um plugging this this thesis he has which seems very uh, very accurate which is that um billionaire philanthropy is a sham designed to make them feel better (laughs) <laughs> about the harm they've done to society and he you says you don't become even, a, yeah <laughs> yeah exactly you don't become a billionaire in a without society. exploiting people and the exactly <laughs> that's exactly his point oh, really? this yeah. is a, a great example because i mean with, with this is a kind of like a uh uh an own goal almost for jeff bezos because he's there on the one hand saying here's two billion dollars ignore the fact i literally just spent five and a half billion dollars mm-hmm. going into space <laughs> earlier this year just two months ago you yeah. know it's it's and the fact that in that statement he he said you know i went to space and i got this profound sense of oh we need to save our planet um I, that's the, i think that's the telltale sign like you say martin that this is a pr move at least partially because he's linking it directly to, <laughs> to his space trip to justify what he just did yeah um yeah going into space and incurred all that criticism um for the record I'm not against him going into space. We talked we talked that about a few episodes ago. Mm-hmm. If Billy, if I were a billionaire, I might go into space too. I also um am really pleased he's given two billion dollars and that he's pledged to have a ten billion dollar fund. And I I wish I could be as optimistic as you, Martin, that he's going to increase that ten billion dollars <laughs> to a lot more. But I also want to stress that he's just spent five point five billion dollars going into space. That is a very, yeah. very highly um carbon emitting process of course um and he's committed to spending 10 billion dollars on combating climate change that's less admittedly just less but that is less than double of the cost of going into space and that's a permanent yes. program that's a business he set up that's going to keep going into space and he's going to keep spending money on you know yeah it's true so, yeah so so it's not so he's it's not like he's actually making up the difference in my mind um but particularly because that $10 billion, like you say, Martin, we don't know how he's going to spend it. I wouldn't be surprised with my sceptical hat on um, if what he's going to do is set up a whole bunch of Amazon offices and branches 
uh, his own employees to run all these kind of programs, philanthropic programs to mm -hmm. combat climate change, um, instead of actually what would be more efficient, which is giving that money to all the myriad of charities that already are in place with the structures and in yeah. desperate need of the finances to do the work, like the Rainforest Alliance and people like that, um, who desperately need money to actually make a difference and have the skills and the experience and the infrastructure to do it. They just need the funding. And I wouldn't be surprised if he sets up all these Amazon brands. Am Amazon, Amazon Give or something, isn't it? It's gonna be yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. And it's going to be, they take a they take a percentage of your donation. Oh, gosh. Like, yeah. like most do. And, yeah. and then the rest goes to saving the world, so to speak. Yeah, yeah I mean, Amazon, they've pledged, haven't they, to, to go net... Uh, to go net zero uh they have, which is great. by 2040 i mean again it's a pledge it's a it's a hollow pledge until it's achieved but yeah and 2040 is too late most right. climate activists yeah. and scientists will tell you 2030 <clears throat> is the date that we need to meet most mm -hmm. things by we've literally got less than a decade to achieve pretty much all our aims in order to meaningfully curb the rise in temperatures so 2040 is it's nice to have that date but it's a classic um i mean how old is bezos He's old enough uh, to still be alive. Fifties, yeah, but he, he'll technically should have retired by twenty forty. So he can, he set a twenty forty date. He probably won't have retired, but he could have retired, and he can say, "Well, if we have, Amazon hasn't met it, that's the new boss's fault. It's not my fault." You know, I'm yeah, exactly. always yeah. always skeptical of those kind of long grass dates. Um, yeah, which be, governments and people use. Yeah, he'll be like seventy. 76 then yeah 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 he'll still be around to take the blame but you know he won't necessarily be in charge of amazon he's already stepped back hasn't he um he's i just want to hand it over control i just wonder what he want his legacy to be ultimately so i think people's mm. thoughts about their own legacy and how they're viewed probably changes when they get older especially when they're reaching retirement it's like i want to make loads and loads of money and build an empire and then maybe perhaps perhaps if you're being optimistic they'll be like and I want to help people with the billions I've, yeah, like actually earn. But I don't know. We can we can hope, can't we? We can hope. We can hope. We can we can be hopeful. Um, it's definitely a good start. It's a good start. It's a shame it happened in twenty twenty one and not twenty ten, but you know it's happened, and hopefully more billionaires will follow suit. Indeed, indeed. Um, okay, so let's move on to another big announcement. Uh, which was the Global Methane Pledge, mm -hmm. uh, which is basically um, a, a major step in meeting that 1.5 degree target, uh, which is, uh, it was announced by President Joe Biden of the US and the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, I think that's how you say her name, uh, basically the head of the EU. Um, so that's 26, or... Oh. 26 nations uh, in Europe, a part of the EU. Um, I think they're the ninth biggest, the EU that is, is the ninth biggest uh, emitter of carbon uh, in the world. Um, US is the second biggest after China. Um, anyway, they announced this uh, global methane pledge, uh, which aims to cut methane emissions globally by 30% compared to 2020 levels and more than 100 countries which between them make up nearly half of global methane emissions have signed the pledge yes uh, and that's that's really good and including um canada south korea and brazil and that's quite big because obviously brazil has a lot of cattle for those who don't know <laughs> methane is in fact farming in general i think contributes 13 percent of carbon emissions globally and half of that is cows or rather cattle contributing emitting methane farting basically belching they mm -hmm. just they're very they gassy animals they absolutely love they, it they do they just belch it out fart it out um so the increasing demand for cattle increasing demand for meat is one of the biggest problems we have in terms of battling climate change and contributing towards climate change so this is a really big thing this is really good um and uh, i may have just said it but methane has accounted for 30 percent of global warming um, since the Industrial Revolution began. Yes, so uh, they're, tr they're trying to cut it by 30% tw by 2030 compared to 2020, that's right. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. right. Um, yeah. uh, and they believe that if they do that, um, they can avoid 0.3 degrees Celsius of warming. 
That's so, a, that's a big chunk of the quite a hefty chunk, one point five, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Or oh, the two point seven. Two point seven. So well, yeah. two, we're, aim, we're on the way to two point seven. We're aiming so that'd be, that'd 4. be two point five. That'd be two point four. Brings us down to two point four. That's <laughs> that's zero point nine away from our targets. I think that's pretty good. It's a chunk. Um, yeah. Problem is though. Yeah. Um, oh, Martin, do you, are you about to say this? Well, I'm sure we're going to say the same thing. But there are some big players missing, aren't there, from this pledge? Yeah. Some big players. You think about the you know the biggest biggest polluters in the world, or you know some of the biggest. You know, China being the biggest, they are yeah. not included in this pledge they're not including yeah. themselves in this pledge neither are India which is actually mad and <laughs> Russia as well which of course is another huge nation for, for methane uh, I was about to say production but that's not right emission yeah so you know it's one of those do you want to hear the good news or the bad news kind of yeah. situations uh, <laughs> yeah. with this one um, so half of the world's top 30 methane emitters are there but some of the biggest China, India, and Russia are not. So, yeah, yeah, it's part of the way there. And India, well, I'm sure we'll move on to it a little bit later, but they have mm. made pledges elsewhere, but yeah. not in relation to this, which is interesting as to why. That's what I don't get. Why, why they... have they not joined this pledge when they've made another announcement? Yes. It, we'll get on to it, but, yeah, it's, it's tempting to see this is pure politics. Obviously, yeah. for this particular industry, we're looking at yeah. the farming industry, yeah. They don't. They genuinely don't think it would be possible without crippling that section of their economy. Whereas right. they think there's ways in which they can. I mean, part. Of, we'll, we'll move on to it, I imagine, but the the kind of the net zero can almost be paid for, <laughs> which is one of the criticisms of it. Yeah. But yeah, because net zero is. But yeah, as as it suggests, it's your your carbon emissions are net zero, so not gross zero. It's not like you're producing okay. nothing, but net. So there are ways in which you can balance. Um, yes. The amount of carbon, whether that's planting yeah. trees or whether that's using the resources of other nations and their... I mean, that's something that has been done in the past, isn't it? Using other nations' uh, what's it, capacity. Yeah, um, that's what they so call their it, allowance yeah. of, of carbon and yeah. basically paying for that. So that Carbon it, credits, they call it. Carbon so credits, yes. Yeah, a, so a country that basically... And this is quite common. There are small countries, small islands, for example, that re- that have the ability to use hydropower or wave energy and wind energy and solar energy. And they're a small enough population. They don't have any damaging industries that emit loads of carbon. So they have really good carbon credit in that they basically contribute nothing to global warming because they're a small community, which is renewably powered, and they don't have massive industry that like or farming that damages the environment and the atmosphere. And rich countries will literally pay them for their carbon credit and then add that credit to their own carbon emissions in one of the it's craziest... Such a scam. Sc- yeah, I just say, uh, it's like, what the hell? Who came up with this? It's, if you're, I mean, that person's presumably working for a World Bank because they're in finance, making loads of money with that cre- clever idea. But it's such a scam, like Martin says, absolute scam. Um, which is the problem? You mentioned net zero. Uh, most climate activists will say net zero is one of the worst things that have been conceived because it's such a, a lie in the first place. And the fact that people aren't even meeting net zero targets, which is saying we're still going to pollute the planet, but we're going to somehow address the balance, um, whether it's by planting trees or um, just reducing the amount by which we pollute. Um, we're going to aim for net zero. And no one's uh, achieved that, even with this carbon credit scam going on. It's, it's mad. This is how bad the situation is. Yeah, and without They've going... created loopholes for themselves and they're still failing. <laughs> and without going too far down the rabbit hole, but the net, the net zero thing of the carbon emissions is, is very much that's at the kind of the government level, um, mm. what they're allowed to uh, pollute into the atmosphere. But of course, there's a lot of un... Um, registered businesses and unlawful practices going on like deforestation in in the amazon yeah. that's illegal and so that does that doesn't even count towards the the net zero target that's in addition to but it's not counted for because it's yeah. illegal activity so it's worse than the official figures suggest as well right so net zero can't even be achieved in even the theory of it is flawed well even it, even if that's yeah, achieved that on paper to... In yeah. reality, <clears throat> there's there's a lot of emi- carbon emissions that are going under the radar because it's not at that official level. It's it's you know it's off the record, so to speak. Yeah, because it's being done <clears throat> by illegal illegal industries. So, yeah, it's it's a shit show to be honest. To put yeah, it to put it terrifying. 
Yeah, so oh. back to me thing. Back to me thing. Back Lo- to me lovely, thing. lovely, lovely me thing. Lovely, yeah. lovely me thing. So, yeah. Well, it's good. I'm, 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 personally, this has been one of my bugbears. In fact, this is the reason I became vegetarian. Um, me and my wife did this because of this. So we're really, really happy to have seen finally somebody talk about it on this kind of level and have such a major announcement. Problem is, as we already acknowledged, it doesn't, like all these things, it doesn't really go far enough because there are some big players who aren't involved. And although you might think, well, you know, Half of the world's methane emissions are being covered by the people who signed up to this pledge. So what, what's wrong with having China and Russia not commit to it? Because, you know, the other half will make up for it by reducing their emissions. Problem is, kids, that Russia and China have, and India haven't signed up to it, which means that they have no reason to curb their current acceleration of methane emissions. It's not just that there's a constant amount of methane emissions being produced. It's accelerating as those industries grow, as their populations grow, as the demand for food grows, as the dependence on meat and cattle grows. So there's nothing to stop Russia, China and India and other countries who haven't signed up to this continuing to expand their methane emissions, which could easily overwhelm any cuts made by the 100 countries that have signed up to this. Assuming, of course, those hundred countries actually meet their targets, which is <laughs> yeah. historically something that has never been achieved. So it's, it's, it's a nice thing to be done, to be said, but we need to see, need to see some policies, I think. How are they going to do it? How are they going to do it? It doesn't work unless people, um, that's us, in, individuals, reduce our demand for it, right? For, for the things that produce the methane. And i do not not trying to get my high horse here on a soapbox and say, everyone should become vegetarian. That's not what I'm saying, because actually a friend of mine um, re- does this professionally. They research um, sustainability and in ecologies and farming, and they themselves eat meat. And they say the best diet for humans is meat once or twice a week, and the rest of the time be vegetarian. So you can still eat meat. Nothing wrong with meat. Go ahead, eat meat. Just you need to reduce the demand for meat. And Don't I say this. Cow week. Yeah. I want to stress this. Not that much, Martin. Please don't eat that much. <laughs> <laughs> um, the reason I, I'm, I want to stress this is because um, we have a government that, in terms of what it says in the UK, is the most green and ecologically friendly and environmentally conscious, conscientious, I should say, um, government that we've ever had. Boris Johnson, our Prime Minister, talks the talk. But they haven't yet introduced a policy that doesn't rely on the private sector to do things itself. So, for example, they've just announced the policy to uh, reduce people's energy consumption by installing heat pumps, uh, which Mm -hmm. use electricity, I think, to heat the air in a house rather than um, relying on gas to heat the homes, for example. Um, They've announced a subsidy for that, but it's a few million pounds. It's going to affect, at best, 90,000 homes. 90,000 was the year. Out of, I think, we need one and a half million at least to change their energy usage in order to make a difference. And in order for heat pumps to be actually effective and to not use up so much electricity that they're still contributing to the problem because we generate electricity by burning coal... um, those houses need to be properly insulated. It's been 15 years, definitely 10 years, definitely six years, or no, five years, uh, since it became this government's policy uh, to insulate homes around Britain properly so that they don't waste heat energy. So, but the, literally the government's position was we've created this fund which will help 90,000 people buy heat, heat pumps so that the heat pumps will become cheaper and more people will buy the heat pumps. And it's like, no, they won't. No, they they won't because they're still really expensive. They're also and yeah, you, they're like yeah. five thousand pounds uh, compared to about fifteen hundred for a gas yeah. pump. Yeah, yeah, it's, and it's, and yeah. also it takes up loads and loads. you need to have a space to store like the heat pump, as it were. Yes, and also it's a com- massive machine. Yeah, and it also compresses air, so it's really really loud. Yeah, so it has to ideally be outside your house and a short distance away in order to not be uh, a bother to you, let alone. I mean, the poor wildlife has to deal with the noise. Um, so that's an example, a complicated example, I admit, of 
an ostensibly green policy that our government has introduced, which actually just relies entirely on a passive government position that relies on ordinary people and industry to actually do the work. Yeah. And that's if that's the approach governments are going to take with this methane pledge, then it's not going to work. It's a similar thing with solar solar panels. It's definitely on the um, on the yeah. individual to make that choice and to invest themselves. Yeah. And I, I, you know, solar panels. I imagine I don't know the price of the individual solar panels, but have reduced in cost over time. They have. But that process has taken what twenty plus years, if not yeah, more. Yeah, the Labour government just don't have the time, do we? Yeah. <laughs> Tony Blair's government started solar panel subsidies in the very early noughties, um, around the turn of the century, and. The take-up has increased significantly, but once the subsidies were removed about a decade ago, the take-up of solar panels decreased rapidly, and the cost has hardly changed. And even before then, the subsidies they introduced were more meaningful because they were literally subsidising solar panels for anybody who wanted them. It wasn't for 90,000 people. It was for anybody. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Anyway, sorry, I'm going to bog down details. I'll stop ranting. <laughs> Um, Martin, you mentioned deforestation a few minutes ago. Um, yes, and that's that's also a pledge, pretty it exciting is. pledge. Yeah, um, well, we'd, you'd, you'd like to think so, wouldn't you? You'd like to think that uh, it would be. <laughs> but the question is, is it really that exciting? And, yeah. um, and the, the pledge is to end deforestation by twenty thirty, and that sounds in, incredibly that's amazing. impressive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, an eight point seven five billion pound. What's that in dollars? One eleven thousand eleven billion dollars. Public finance. Like that, yeah. yeah, public yeah. finance package from twelve countries, including our one, uh, has has basically made this commitment. Mm. So a record of one hundred and ten world leaders signed this pledge to end deforestation by twenty thirty. Um, and one of the major uh, countries that. Um, that came to the table on this is Brazil, and that's very, very important, of course, because yeah. the deforestation in the Amazon, um, and you'd expect <laughs> under the current regime, that has actually exacerbated the issue of deforestation. And I think for the first time in in history, actually, they were it was contributing to to um, to carbon emissions yeah. as opposed to taking carbon out of the atmosphere. Yeah. Um, so that's that's a huge. Uh, a deal there and i don't know whether it's due to um bolsonaro's uh the issue with you know his approval rating as a, as a result of the pandemic he's trying to get back in the good books of of, yeah. uh, of some of the uh the the population i don't know whether Maybe. that's the issue or whether he's just literally playing a front because he knows that it's not going to happen yeah. um but anyway yeah brazil china indonesia russia australia the uk the us and a whole load of others have basically signed this particular pledge um, and they're accountable for 85% of the world's forests. So on the surface, That's this looks huge. fantastic. Yeah. But as I said earlier, a lot of deforestation uh, goes on on the, the black market, as it were, illegally. Mm. Um, and so this, does, of course, won't account for, for that. There needs to be something in place for, um, for tackling illegal deforestation, illegal burning of, of woodland, um, it was something mad, wasn't it? Like uh, the size of uh, a number of football pitches per minute are being destroyed <sighs> in the Amazon. It's just yeah. horrific. A lot uh, of that's by farmers, isn't it? They're burning the land. Like you just say, they're burning the forest land to create grazing land space, or yeah. crop land. Yeah. Um, and just so people are clear, even if you replace the burnt down forest with crops, you're nowhere near making up for the carbon sinking that's, that the forest was doing. I think that's what they call it, carbon <coughs> sinks, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so basically, anyone who doesn't know, plants are good f for fighting climate change because they absorb carbon and they release oxygen, um, part of photosynth photosynthesis. Uh, uh, so deforestation is one of the biggest, um, if not, I think, the biggest, um, after direct carbon emissions of... Um, contributed towards climate change because mm. you're removing all these things that absorb carbon and help remove it from the atmosphere. And I think, on the other hand, of course, there's the side effect of wiping out all the habitats and ecologies for millions of species of animals, insects, birds and mammals and whatever else, reptiles, um, which are dying out at an increasingly rapid rate because of deforestation. And as an aside, uh, deforestation and increased urbanization is what leads to certain wild animals getting caught or eaten by humans and spreading diseases such as 
COVID-19. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so, Bolsonaro, how long has he been in office for now? When did he come in? 2019? Uh, I want to say it was not long before the pandemic. Yeah. I was going to say 2019. I think it's 2019. Yeah. But since he's come into office, deforestation, the rate of deforestation has risen to 34%. So a huge <sighs> amount. That's huge. Which is mad. And so... For him to have signed this is definitely a step in the right direction. But does yeah. anyone actually trust that he's going to follow through yeah. with this if he's in office? I do wonder how much of that twelve billion ish dollars that they've announced as a fund is going to Brazil. And that might be why he's pledged because mm-hmm. he knows there's point. billions of dollars coming in. In which case, do is the, are those billions of dollars really gonna go towards preventing deforestation and um, <laughs> reversing yeah. it by planting trees? I don't think so. There's another issue, actually, with planting trees. Um, a lot of environmentalists are very critical of things, of announcements, like Boris Johnson, for example, has said that planting trees is going to be um, one of the UK's major schemes for combating climate change. Um, I think it is a good thing overall. You know, it's better to plant trees than to cut them down, absolutely. But um, in order to meaningfully meet their targets tree plantations will have to be fast growing trees and fast growing trees are not actually as good for reducing carbon emissions as slow growing trees and they're actually not as good for ecologies and local habitats yeah the biodiversity so, yeah yeah so there's a lot of concern from environmentalists that um by in order by taking this proactive approach of planting trees, governments are going to try to cut corners, of course, by planting fast growing trees. And plantations, because of their very nature, because they're they're cleared land that's then strat in a kind of like structured way of planted trees, um, will be no good for the local environments and lots of local animals won't be able to Yeah, you know, it's, it's like in an oak forest planting a bunch of pine trees, you know, it's not gonna be the same for the local animals. Um and then, of course, uh, there's the social costs. Uh, you know, uh, there's scepticism amongst environmentalists because they care about humans too. Uh, that people will be, you know, um, what's the word? Uh, moved. Displaced. <laughs> displaced, thank you. People will be displaced, thank you. Um, in order to clear land for planting trees. Mm-hmm. And they're concerned about that and and that's uh, a legitimate concern i think uh, so yeah. it'd be nice to know what exactly they're going to do to stop deforestation particularly because and this is where i really have a genuine question um i have wooden furniture most furniture in the shops is made of wood i don't really want it to be made of plastic instead of wood mm-hmm. wood is quite nice people are still <coughs> going to want lots of furniture aren't yeah. they so you can't stop deforestation because you're still going to want to make things out of wood. So what's their plan there? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it'll be interesting to get a breakdown of exactly when when we're looking at the, the, the timber from the Amazon, what it's actually going towards, Yeah. what that raw material is being used for. I mean, at a very basic level, you know, making sure that we're reusing and recycling or upcycling furniture is obviously mm. a very, very good thing, but... I don't know how much of it accounts for furniture. Not sure. Not sure, yeah, making things mm. last as well. It's just, there are little things that we need to do, but it's it's a bit of a myth that that it's just individual responsibility. Like, as in, the, if we all yeah. make sure, if we all recycle, you know, we'll be fine, you know? it's yeah. <laughs> It has to be, everything has to be done at a higher level, an industry level, a national level. Yeah, to actually well, I mean, that's, that's proven by... In the UK, let's let's keep bashing the UK. Uh, recently, we had the shock discovery that um, oh, the recycling. We've been, yeah. yeah, we've been recycling things. Individuals have been doing their best to recycle things, and it's been a national scheme for for years. A national scheme run by local authorities. But what was shocking? Something shocking, like seventy percent, was it? If not like more, that? I think it was more than yeah. <clears throat> nearly three quarters of our recycled waste was just being taken, shipped to Turkey, and dumped in landfills. And a lot of it was being burned. Yep. Plastics and things being burned. You're which is the most toxic thing you can do <laughs> to the environment. Um, so, Awful. it's even though the individuals can do their best, as Martin says, the governments need and authorities and industry need to have coherent, responsible, honest plans for do, for dealing with this. Individuals can only do so much. 
Like they only affect the area around them. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very true. Very true. Oh, it's depressing, oh, isn't it? It is depressing. Getting <laughs> ranty here. Getting ranty. So let's, let's talk about the last major announcement from this week at COP26, uh, which you foreshadowed earlier, Martin, because it's Ooh. got to do with India. Ah, uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's a it's a fairly simple one, I think. Um, he just announced a pledge that India is going to reach net zero emissions, which we've already discussed, by 2070. Yeah. So, yes. Um, he, I mean, in fairness, yeah. I think he also um, introduced some spe- specific goals for 2030. Um, but um, what do you think? I'm not sure what to make of this one. So the Paris Agreement, which you said was in 2015, so you know, only yeah. six years ago, the pledge was 2050 for yeah. net zero. Yeah. So in six years, you know, the, the situation's got much worse and they're actually extending the time for net zero so it's like it does if anything you'd think that they'd reduce it in that time well have the yeah man it just it just seems i mean if if you're being nice it seems cheeky (laughs) (laughs) and and if yeah it just it just seems incredibly disingenuous to to say oh by 2050 we'll get there and then actually yeah six years later we'll add on another well 14 years i guess um to the total or twelve, I guess it's still twenty years actually. Yeah, no, 20 no, years, no, twenty yeah, years. Twenty years. Yeah. yeah. To the total, yeah. it's just uh, it's it's really really disappointing, and they've cited the fact that there's you know they're they're home to one point three billion people, oh, a wow. huge amount of people, and so Definitely to turn that that ship around. around, I get it. Like turning the Titanic around is yeah. is is going, is going to be tough. It's going to be tough, but yeah. oh, it's just it it, it, fall, it falls so far short of what's required at this point, and. Of course, you don't want people to, to lie and say, oh, yeah, we'll get it done by 2030 or 2040 and then again to miss. So uh, maybe they're just being pragmatic and being more realistic, but it, it doesn't it doesn't show any ambition or any urgency yeah. to change things. Um, so I, mean, I think you've just hit the nail on the head for me. It's kind of even if even if you know you're not going to meet your target, if you try <laughs> to meet the target, say 2035, which I think is actually what activists are saying is what we need to aim for, not 2050. I think it's 2035 that they're saying is net zero is, is the better target. Um, even if you know you're not going to meet 2035, if you try to meet 2035, you might accidentally meet 2040. Yeah, yeah. it's the it's the ultimate um, Parkinson's law. Have you heard of Parkinson's law? I haven't. No. Well, Parkinson's, Parkinson's law is the 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 idea that if you give someone a certain amount of time to do a bit of right, work, yeah. then ex- the, the the task will expand to meet that time. So you yeah. give someone a day to do it, uh, two weeks to do a project, they'll take all two weeks. If you give them a day to do it, they'll get it done in the day. It's like, yeah. the, the, it's like the ultimate version of that. That yeah. if you give them, uh, what was it, 50 years, almost, they'll yeah. take 50 years. You give them 20, they'll take 20. But that relies on there being almost repercussions for not hitting it. Whereas the whole, the issue with all of this is that the repercussions aren't necessarily felt by those individual nations or financial implications for their nations. It's very much... A, sh- a shared responsibility that actually falls between the cracks, and I think that's that's the problem with with trying to hit these climate goals. Is <clears throat> if India don't hit theirs, they say, "Oh, well, we didn't hit ours," but you know, China didn't hit theirs, or Russia didn't hit theirs. They didn't even sign up. We at least signed up. You know, it's like the responsibility falls between the nations, and actually, you have to have a united front for this to work. Yeah, um, that, that that ultimately is why I think it's failed up until this point. It's like, but what about this? Well, what aboutism, isn't it? What about this country? What about this country though? Yeah, Britain hasn't hit theirs, but China has been so much worse. You know, and it's yeah, it was, there's so much finger pointing at others. And actually, we need to come together. It has to be a united front, and and still even now, with a lot of these people not signing up to like the 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 methane pledge or or whatever else it is, deforestation pledge, it's we're still divided. We're still playing. Yeah. We're still playing national politics as opposed to coming together, and that's. I think that's the, the ultimately the reason why myself and you are so sceptical, and other people are too. I genuinely couldn't put it better myself. That that's a nice summary of everything that's wrong here. Is that there's always that massive caveat at the end of the day, which is there's no way to enforce the nations to do any of this, and it's to be honest. And to end on a positive note, I'm astonished we've reached this point where all these nations are suddenly willing to make these commitments. 
because even if they don't follow through, it's 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 a they're politicians in the end, and politicians like to save face. They don't like to be embarrassed. Mm. So when a politician comes out and says something like this, makes a commitment to the world, to the United Nations on a global scale, and says we're going to do this, and they don't do it, they're at least going to try something. And although I'm skeptical of what they'll actually achieve. I'm still astonished that they're willing to step up there on that platform, on that podium, and say, we're going to do this. There are other things um, to make me sceptical, such as, uh, I think there was the president of Barbados, if they have a president, the prime minister of Barbados, uh, whatever, who gave a really good speech about um, criticising the point that one of the pledges made um, back in 2011, 20, no, 2009, sorry, um, was that... Um, Ironically, the developing world, which is kind of best positioned in many ways to not contribute towards carbon emissions, um, is the one that doesn't have the money or the resources to actually actively develop the rent renewable technologies, to develop in such a way that they won't repeat the mistakes of the Industrial Revolution of everyone else, the developed world. Yep. Um, so in order to help with that... Um, I think scientists estimated and economists estimated they'd need somewhere in the trillions of dollars every year to meaningfully develop in a sustainable way that won't damage the world. Um, but they agreed in 2009 at one of these conferences that they would give $100 billion a year by 2020 to developing countries to help them develop their technologies and their industries and their economies sustainably, uh, which was good. You know, it's, it's something. It's much better than nothing. But that target was to reach $100 billion a year by 2020. 2021's come round and the developed world has given $80 billion to the developing world. So they've missed that target that they set themselves. And in this speech, the President of Barbados was very critical in saying, can we sort this out first? Because whilst you've failed to give $100 billion a year, which was the minimum we decided we needed to the developing world to help them battle climate change um, you've somehow found 25 trillion dollars of quantitative easing to help your own economies during the recession and the pandemic and she wasn't criticizing them for that she was saying that's good your central banks have done great things to help your own economies during these crises so where's the extra few billion dollars we need to meet your target the commitment mm -hmm. you made you know 12 yeah. years ago yeah. And I, and I think that's it. I wonder if that's the reason why we're now seeing all these world leaders come together and make these pledges, even if they don't intend to keep them fully, they might achieve them partially. Is it because of the pandemic? Is it because mm. we've had this massive crisis and suddenly everyone is like, you know, when it came down to it, we all got together and we all acted. Maybe, maybe we, we shouldn't remove ourselves from the climate pledges anymore because well, obviously some of them are, but um, a lot of them aren't, um, because they're suddenly in this situation where we realise we need each other. The poorer countries needed the richer countries to give them the vaccine. The uh, richer countries needed the poorer countries to do all the menial jobs that the people weren't willing to do um, when a virus was rampant through the countries. Um, people suddenly became acutely aware of the suffering of other nations in the pandemic. And I think also, hopefully, certainly in the UK and maybe the same in other countries, I think people suddenly realise how much the world has changed because cars weren't driving around, planes weren't filling the sky, trains were running half their services, and people weren't travelling to work and they were just going for walks in the park or, in, if they were lucky enough, in the countryside if they lived nearby. And people were suddenly able to appreciate, oh, you know what, actually, humans make a lot of noise and pollution. Mm, and when perhaps. we're not doing all that crap, we, the world can be quite nice. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Or maybe they're just, as you say, they're just literally trying to save face because they know they won't be in office. Yeah. For very long. And in fact, the only ones who are not doing these pledges are those who have such a authoritarian di dictatorship over their nations that they will be in office then. And so they'll look even more stupid when they don't comply to the pledges. So they can't give them in the first place. That's an astute observation.
Yeah. It's these <laughs> Putin's, yeah. De facto dictators. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's all the yeah, de facto dictators that are going to be there for decades to come that won't pledge. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone else will be like, well, I'm gone anyway, whether either dead or out of office. So uh, yeah. I can make say this what pledge. I like. the next guy to sort Exactly. Out, yeah. Oh, well, I made yeah. the pledge. Aren't yeah. I good? Give me a round of applause at this event. Yeah. Yeah. This will set me up for my million pounds electoral career after politics. Yeah. Maybe I'm being skeptical. No. <laughs> I don't I think, think I am, I've got to be I honest. I don't think you are. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think you're being quite accurate. <laughs> oh. oh, dear. Oh, well, um, I suppose there's no really easy way to segue out of this, but uh, <clears throat> no. please let us know what you think uh, listening to us. Either go to Twitter, at JInterestingYT, um, or I'm at Alltime Robin. And I'm at Mart Interesting. Mart Interesting, yes, he is. Yes. Um, please uh, share your thoughts on COP26, your... your Optimisms, your pessimisms, your scepticisms, your cynicisms. And if there's another word that's positive, like optimism, I can't think of it right now. Your hopes. <laughs> yes, your hopes for the future. Let, let us know what you think. And uh, speaking of what you think, let's look at our favourite comments from the past week. So our last podcast episode was a Halloween special. And we talked about true supernatural experiences that we asked you, our lovely listeners and viewers, to submit and send to us. Um, but we also had a Halloween quiz. And one of the questions was about the Adams family. Um, and Lady Coy says, "Thing, the hand in the in the Adams family, mm. the disembodied hand. I guess that's the word for it. <laughs> um, Thing was actually played by the same actor as Lurch, the waiter in the original series. Sorry, the butler. Um, except for when they were both on screen at the same time, and then it was the director's hand." Which uh, I never knew yeah. that, and I think that that's that's fascinating. In fact, that's so fascinating. I almost stole that for my thing I learned this week, but I thought I'd use it, address it in the comments. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Yeah. Well, I've got one from Funky Monkey One Two Three Five. <laughs> so no four there. One Two Three Five. And Funky Monkey One Two Three Five says <laughs> Alex looks like a rejected Kiss member or a typical ICP <laughs> fan. So if you go back to the video, Alex does look a little bit like he was from Kiss. And it, 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 it caught me off guard because I didn't get the memo about dressing up. Very sorry. And, um, no, you did fine. And so Alex came along fully dressed as Gene Simmons and uh, with a shorter oh. tongue, let's be honest. Um, but yeah, he, he, did, he did a good job there. He really did. He really did. Oh. Yeah, he did, yeah, he did like yeah. skeleton face paint. It was a real surprise. It was great. I was not it, expecting it, that, yeah. It reminded like the kind of Day of the Dead kind of thing going on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was good. 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 I do quite like that look, Day of the Dead, with all the, the Mexican style yeah. uh, skulls. It's got that yeah. distinctive art style, hasn't it, which is pretty cool. Have you, did you, um, have you seen Coco? Yes, yes. Oh, I, I love that. it. It's, yeah. pretty, it's probably my favourite Pixar film. Like, just the... Um, the animation on the skeletons was like nothing they'd done before. And the, the vibrant colours was just, ah, oh, that film was just amazing. I love that film. It's brilliant. Um, but away from Mexico and, and Coco and on to Ruzi J, who says that in the Jay. Netherlands, we don't trick or treat on Halloween, but oh. we do celebrate St. Martin's hey. in a similar way by going door to door with homemade lanterns and singing songs for candy. Oh, that's interesting. That's yeah. carol singing, but Halloween. But Halloween, yeah. yeah. I like it. Except it's not Halloween, it's St. Martin's Day. St. Martin's. Which is but which is November the 11th, I think. What songs are you singing, Ruzi J? I'm interested now. Yeah. What songs do you sing? Are they are they Dutch songs? Or are they you know, internationally known songs? Do you sing a bit of Spice Girls or Britney Spears? <laughs> Let us know. Let us know in the comments below. Um, that's, that's interesting. And... Mm. I think that's because um, I mentioned, I think my fact last episode was about the village of Killin in Scotland, which celebrated Halloween on November the 11th, St. Martin's Day, until uh, the First World War. And I think in the same article I read that, they were saying they their tradition was to go around singing as well. Mm -hmm. um, but they didn't uh, specify homemade lanterns. Yeah. There we also, go. Also, yeah, what lanterns are they made? Are they made out of are they pumpkins? Yeah, like yeah. Or are I mean, they... are you carrying them around? So you think is there some kind of handle? Yeah, because hmm. pumpkins would be pretty uh, pretty hefty. Yeah. Though as as we learned last week, the original lanterns were um turnips, weren't they? Turnips slightly, right. Yeah. Slightly more conducive to putting a handle through and carrying like that, I guess. That's true. Than, That's than true. a pumpkin. Yeah, yeah. Did you yeah. carve a pumpkin this year, Robin? I didn't. I didn't. You did. I, I was... did. I did. You did. Yeah, I did. Oh, I managed to I nice. I did. I carved yeah. one and it was, it was you... good. Was it, uh, what did your, your baby, your little children think? 
Oh yeah, loved it, loved it. Although loved my it, pumpkin yeah. was definitely worse than my wife's. Her, she did it really well, oh, nice. and mine was mine was a bit kind of rough and ready and jagged. But it worked quite well for the kind of horror theme because it was, you know, oh, disfigured okay. by its very nature. It was deliberate. Yeah. Yes, of course, yeah, of course. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I was kind of amused. I went to our local church. Uh, I walked by and they put pumpkins outside, but they yeah. carved they carved crosses. <laughs> Into them. <laughs> of course, not, not faces. Course they, they, didn't, did. they didn't cross it. <laughs> and I, was, I looked at it. I was like, "That's a bit of a bit of a mix of traditions there." I feel like you're yeah. missing some. <laughs> nice try. Maybe. Nice yeah, try. yeah. You're getting into getting into the spirit in some way. I bet you it was yeah. like, bet it was like some youth leader was like, "This would be really cool, man." <laughs> yeah. People respect us for this. Maybe, uh, maybe. We had a, a couple more comments about. I feel like this is going to go on forever, but a couple of podcasts ago, we talked about a tradition where people knock on doors and run away. Is that right? Yeah, it, it continues. Uh, it continues. The comments come in. <laughs> people are still su- 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 just submitting their names for it. So I can't remember what you called it. Martin. Knock down ginger. Right. Knock down ginger. You called it that. Mm-hmm. Um, some other people have commented saying they called it that. Uh, Caroline W commented saying, we called it Postman's Knock. I haven't that heard that one before. Sense. Yeah. Postman's I haven't heard it, but it yeah. makes... Makes sense. I mean, the postman knocks on your door, so yeah. Um, yeah so you might think it's the postman, and you get there and you're like, oh, it's nobody there. Did you see End O'Driscoll's? I didn't. Called it Knock a Dolly. Knock a Dolly. Yeah. Also, she, she writes. Huh. Also, I always heard it as Jackie the Lantern as a child. Jackie the Lantern. Jackie. Jackie the Lantern. I imagine oh, like Jack I'm Jack Lantern. It's kind of cute, but no, it's Jack a Lantern. Yeah, definitely. yeah. Jackie the Lantern. Yeah. I like it like it so yeah so if you want to keep your your names for a knock a door run or knock down ginger or or chap the door run away or or a chapping at the door or ding dong ditching ding dong yeah, ditch river troyer says yeah so keep ring coming. and run from yeah. quinn o shaughnessy <laughs> apologies if i There's butchered so your surname yeah yeah so congratulations guys we have a million names for the one single <laughs> It makes me just want to go and do it now. I just want to knock on someone's door and run off. I admit I, I've had similar thoughts since this started. <laughs> but I think we're a bit too old for that. Maybe. 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 I have to do the case. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Well, thank you all for your comments, for those suggestions. Um, please let us know your thoughts on COP26. And thank you all for listening. And we promise Alex will be back soon. Yeah. We need to go and bail him probably, don't we? Probably should. He's yeah, getting cold. I mean, let's find out when the court date is first. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> Sounds good. Right. And we have to ask him right. what he was doing on the M25 as well. I know. He's got a bit confused. Yeah. It's just what happens when you're angry. You just got so angry. And I'm, going to to lo- go I'm, going to, I'm going to Westminster, he said. <laughs> I'm going to protest at Westminster, the heart of UK government. <laughs> yep. Uh, oh, Alex, uh, Alex, Alex. <laughs> Such a fool. A romantic fool, but a fool nonetheless. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for listening. Thank you all for watching. And we'll see you next time. Uh, I just realised that people in America have no idea what's going on with people protesting on the, the roads here. <laughs> That's going to be funny. <laughs> <laughs> Bye.